Good morning, everybody. Robert Carrillo here at Metro Vision. Good to have you with us this morning. Thank you for for tuning in or for turning on or however you got to this uh, point. But it's great to have you with us. And boy, we are in the climax, the pinnacle, the the heart of the book of Hebrews. Uh, we're in chapter eleven. And last class, we, we dived into 11. I've been able to pretty much keep at a, a pace of about a chapter a class, but this is so rich and so dense and so packed with just amazing and wonderful things that uh, I just, I'm not going to rush through this. Uh, as it is, I'm keeping up a pretty quick pace, uh, not camping out in either in any of the, 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 the mentions in the Hall of Fame of, of uh, Hall of Faith, I should say. Um, the great hall of faith of these stories that are mentioned, but I am trying to just let us at least know why they're in here and what, what, what particularly happened. And of course, if you want to know more about in more detail, we, we've got definitely with the book that uh, John Oaks and I wrote, uh, you can get more. And if you want to know even more than that, then, um, I will be, uh, Providing more resources, you can go to my, my, actually my blog, thewaythepilgrim.com, and there's resources there to dig even deeper. But, um, a lot of great stuff here. Just wonderful, wonderful stuff that so inspiring, so incredible. And it really is, it's the heart of the message of Hebrew, of, of the book of Hebrews is having faith. As if you remember, we, you know, we studied of why was the book of Hebrews written? Well, because because Christians were being threatened and were beginning to shrink back, particularly Jewish Christians, which was the foundation of the church. The early church was mostly Jewish Christians. And um, there's debate over, was this letter written to a specific community or to the Hebrews, the Jews across the, the, the empire, or, you know, was, 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 did it have a certain few people in mind? But, but as we know, reading it, uh, there is so much for us to learn from and so much for us to be inspired by and, and convicted by and encouraged by. And, and, and that is the word of this letter, right? The exhortation or encouragement. It's the key word here that is, comes up again and again and again. And it even calls itself a word of encouragement or a word of exhortation. Um, so, so here we are in the heart of it. Um, So uh, we started out with a, you know, very just simple definition of faith that's very on point. And and then he starts going through the examples and we'll pick up there. And again, why are the all these examples so important? Because all of us will go through challenges as Christians, as people of faith, as disciples of Jesus, as the, the nation of God, as the people of God. We will go through our ups and downs and, and oftentimes in a church, most of the attention gets put on helping people become Christians, at least in our churches. In most churches, that's not the case. But in our fellowship, we put a lot of attention and a lot of focus on helping people become Christians. And that's great. That's wonderful. We're trying to carry out Matthew 28. We're very missional. We're very mission minded. And that's one of absolutely our strengths. And that's a good thing. However, what happens after somebody gets baptized and now they've got to live a faithful, devoted life following Jesus for anywhere from a year to 70 years, you know, before they either die or Jesus comes back. One of the two is going to happen, but that can be a very long period of time. And in that period of time, we will go through many, many challenges and ups and downs and how we handle those challenges. How we deal with those difficulties uh, uh, it makes all the difference in the world. And faith is the key in all this, that we remain faithful through difficulties, through challenges, that we persevere. Perseverance is a fruit of faith. It's part of faith that, that, that we, we all go through things that we don't want to happen and we wish it wouldn't happen or we wish that, that this didn't occur or we wish that God would relieve us. And the question is, are we remaining faithful? Uh, some people, when they when they face challenges, uh, their faith is small, so they they uh, quickly fall into anger. Why didn't God answer my prayer? Why didn't God do what I wanted? Why didn't God make this happen? Or sometimes into discouragement and disappointment. Um, you know what? What I'm just so discouraged. None of this happened. I believed and and disheartened, and they shrink back. 
you know, and or or they get fearful and run away, you know, and of the, the threat, the what could happen to me, how I might suffer as a Christian, uh, any of those scenarios, or really, I should say all of those scenarios, every person of God is going to go through those scenarios. And again, the question is, what do you do when you're in that? Do you get angry? Do you get discouraged? Do you, do you get disheartened? Or do you get faithful, you know, re- make your faith rise up to the challenge and overpower that challenge with faith? And that's basically the plea here. That's basically the challenge of the book of Hebrews is he makes this massive, amazing argument about how much better, greater a covenant we have than the Old Testament. And of course, that's very much aimed at the Jewish Christians who were tempted to go back to the old covenant, who were tempted to fall back onto a acceptable religion for which they would not be so persecuted. And of course, we all know Jews have been persecuted many times in history, but not at this point. At this point, it was the Christians who were in those crosshairs of persecution. It was the Christians who got fed to lions and put on stakes and burned in Nero's gardens and and who were getting confiscated their property and and losing everything. And so the temptation for the Jewish Christians was to say, well, hey, I'm a Jew. I'm not a Christian. And the, 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 the parallel for us today is it's easier to just be a religious person, just fall back into accepted religiousness, religiosity, you know, that, hey, I'm a Christian, you know, and I believe in Jesus. And, and every once in a while I go to church and I try to be a nice person. That's kind of the common American Christianity that most people ascribe to that call themselves Christians. They're not people who are digging in the scriptures, striving to walk with God, striving to love each other. Some are, and I don't, and I don't mean to just, you know, broad stroke everybody, because there are people out there who are just really living a faithful, loyal, devoted life. But, but the masses we know are not, right? Much like it was in Jesus' day, Jesus preached to thousands But in the book of Acts, chapter one tells us he had 120 true disciples, disciples, people the Bible called disciples, even though there were thousands who heard him, thousands, but 120 disciples. So it's always a small group, the faithful people. It's never the majority. I mean, even the idea of moral majority is outrageous because it never happens right? It's always countercultural. It's always a small group. It's a few that are faithful, that stick to God. And that's what this chapter is basically calling us to remember. These are the people who were commended as holy and righteous by God because of their faith, because they didn't give up. So we're going to jump right on in where we left off. I I believe I left off uh, with Abraham and Isaac and talking about how how Abraham even reasoned that God could raise Isaac from the dead. And that's, that's kind of key to faith, you know, is understanding that, that God can turn around anything. And even if he asks you to give everything, he can give far more back to you, you know, and he can put you back on your feet and he can do anything that, that, that is needed to happen. One of the key lines in this back in verse six, it says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. That is a key to faith is, is you have to believe that God will reward you. You know, the God will make it. I know that some of us have been in difficult situations for many years. Some of us have been in a ministry that has not grown, that has not done very well for years and, 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 And we've been praying, God help us, God rescues, God make my church great, strong and healthy again. And God help me to get to where I need to be or where my ministry to get to where it needs to be. And and God doesn't answer our prayers on on our timeline, but he does answer our prayers. I mean, Michelle and I fully believe that we're here by faith. We're here because God called us to be here to help strengthen this ministry. And in some ways you could even say, we're here because you prayed for us to get here. You, uh, you, you asked God to send somebody <clears throat> and God tapped our shoulders. And that's 
why we're here. Not that I'm saying we're the answer to everything or anything of that, but we do know how to help people walk with God and love each other. And at the end of the day, that's what really matters. That and making disciples and being disciples. And, and, and that's what we're good at. That's what we're going to do. That's what we're focused on right now is walking with God and loving him, loving each other and making disciples and being disciples. That, that's it. That's in a nutshell. Somebody wants to say, what's the philosophy of your ministry? There it is right there. Bam. We focus on what's most important and we do that well. Everything else just comes along. That's what Hebrews is basically calling the first one. Get back to God. Put your faith in him. The, you know, the, the, uh, the, another key is keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus, right? And that's kind of where it all starts is we focus on Jesus, which is really also focusing on God is Jesus is God in the flesh and in him is the spirit of God and he is the exact image of God. And he is in a sense who God sent to help us connect to God, right? To, 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 to be the connector, the bridge builder, as we read in Hebrews two and three. And, and, and the perfect savior for us. So, so we'll jump on in right here. We're in verse 20. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau and returned in regard to their future. God knew the future. God knew where things were going to go and he blessed them both. They were both well blessed, well taken care of. Um, by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshiped as he leaned on top of his staff, he, he, he didn't know what was going to come, what was going to happen, how the promised land was going to be delivered and, and all that. But he knew that it would happen. And this is probably one of the keys really with all these guys, with with Jacob and with Joseph, particularly Joseph, because, of course, Joseph goes to Egypt. And, and he had to believe in the promises of God. They held on to that, that their children would be like the stars in the sky at night and the sand on the seashore and that they would, the promised land would be delivered to them. I mean, imagine that they're just a small group, them and their children and their servants and their sheep and their, you know, and somehow this entire land, this entire country is going to be given to them. And they did, they died without ever seeing that happen. But they had faith and they believed and they stayed faithful. You know, some of the greatest dreams and the greatest uh, promises that God makes, most of us will never live to see them happen. And that's okay. I mean, the truth is, if, if I'm going to live my life devoted to a vision or a dream, it ought to be bigger than me, right? It ought to be bigger than my life. It ought to be big enough that it will bless my children and my grandchildren and my friends and their children and their grandchildren. It should be big enough to change the world, which I don't expect to happen in my life. One of the mistakes we made in the past was trying to change the world one generation. And, 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 and the only, and what I mean by mistake was that that was what it meant to be faithful. Well, if God wants to change the world in one generation, he will do that. But it didn't happen in the first century. The world was not evangelized at the end of the first century. It didn't happen at the end of the second century. I mean, there were parts of the world that didn't receive the gospel for centuries later, until centuries later. So it was God's plan to change the world and to win the world for Jesus. But that didn't happen like that. And again, we always just have to be careful that we're not trying to make God fill our timeline, that by faith, we trust his timeline. And that's what Jacob and Joseph uh, did. That's what, what Isaac and Jacob and Joseph did. They trusted God. By faith, Joseph, when his and was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instruction concerning the burial of his bones. See, he believed that we're going to go back to the promised land. Why? Because he believed God, that God was giving them the promised land, that God would give that land to them. That's why he called Abraham out. And, and he knew that that would eventually happen. So by faith, he told them, he left instructions, don't bury my bones in Egypt, bury my bones in the promised land. And, and that was how solid his faith was actually, actually was. He says, and then we switch to Moses. And Moses, of course, I mean, he's, he's the big guy. He's, he is the, the big prophet. He is in a lot of ways, um, the, the, the father of Judaism, you know. I mean, say Abraham is in the sense he's, he is the father of Jews. He's also the father of the Arabs and, 
and the other Middle Eastern tribes. But, but, but Moses is absolutely the, the prophet of Judaism. You know, he's the one that was given the Ten Commandments. He's the one that rescued them from slavery. He's the one that led them at least to the promised land. And of course, Joshua leads them into the promised land. But Moses is very much a prefigure, a foreshadowing of Jesus, right? There's so many things. We've talked about that a little. And it says, so he starts out talking about Moses. He says, by faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. <clears throat> you know, they, they, because his parents were people of faith, they recognized that Moses was given to them by God. They recognized that Moses would be safe, that God's promises would be fulfilled in him. And by faith, I mean, you think about what she did. She built that little ark, that little bassinet, put him in a river full of crocodiles, mind you, and pushed him toward, you know, out into the river. And maybe he knew, you know, like the movie plays it that, that, um, that the, the, the princesses of Egypt were right there playing on the river Nile. Um, and maybe they knew that it would float right into that. I don't know, but I mean, ask any mother to put her three month old in a basket in a river and push him out there is insane. But by faith, she did it by faith. She gave up her own son really in a sense, putting him in God's hands, you know, and trusting that God would work through them. And he says, um, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. You know, the, the, the fact that, that, I mean, any, any young man, of course, wants the best, right? I want, would love to have a really nice sports car and have all the clothes they want and the latest electronics and all the coolest, latest stuff. And who would say no to all that? Who would turn down the luxuries of life, especially in a world where to not be rich was incredibly difficult, even more so in a world to be of your own descent meant that you were a slave. And yet Moses rejected being called the son of Pharaoh. He, he chose to be, to be recognized and to be mistreated with his people, the, the people of God. I mean, that is, that is a huge amount of faith. I don't even know how he had that faith. He had it though. He had, to, maybe it was just character at that point and it became faith when he met God. But, but that's a lot of faith to make that, that decision and to, to choose that way of life. You know, and, and, and I mean, faith was there inherently, intrinsically. I'm not sure how, but, but he says by faith, he made these decisions. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. I mean, it's interesting because, because he, he, obviously he doesn't know Jesus. He doesn't know the Messiah, but he knows the promises of God. And so he chooses literally to suffer for that promise of God, for the hope of God, than to live a life full of pleasure and sin and to be surrounded by the treasures of Egypt. He didn't know Jesus. He didn't know what God had in mind. And yet he did know that he needed to stick to God, that he needed to do what was right. And he had the faith to do that. That's amazing. And it says, um, because he was looking ahead to his reward. You know, again, key to faith is looking ahead to the rewards of God, of knowing that God will bless you. God is not unjust. God will not be mocked. God sees all that we do. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Now, that's another key. That's another key of faith. I mean, there's several really big keys. Keeping your eyes on Jesus, believing that God will reward those who earnestly seek him, and seeing what is invisible. And that is a decision to see the hand of God when it is still invisible, to see what it is doing, to see what he is, how he's moving things, to see how he's setting up things. 
That is really key to living a faithful life. You know, when we go through hard times, I guarantee you, if you look for God's hand, you will see it. You will see him moving. You will see him doing things. I've been through a lot of hard times, been through a lot of deaths, including the death of my mom, the death of my father, the death of my little brother, the death of very significant people in my life. And I've been able to look back and see always how God's hand is moving in it. And, and many times how God has protected me or strengthened me or blessed me through it, even in some of the darkest, most painful times of my life. And, and, and I think sometimes we have to just stop and look for that. That's a key. That's another key to a faithful life. And he says, by faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. So this whole thing of the Passover and putting the blood over the doorpost and, and sharing that meal and the angel of death passing over them, the spirit of, of death passing over them. I mean, of course, all of this they obeyed by faith. They had no idea what this was pointing to. What is this pointing to? This is pointing to the Lamb of God, who is Jesus, who would shed his blood for and to to to, to rescue and to save his people and to set us all up for salvation. The whole world and everybody in it, including you and including me. And, the, and all this was by faith. He did it. He didn't see the whole picture. I think sometimes we get mad because we feel like, well, God, we want you to explain it all to us. We want to know all the parts of it. We want a guarantee. We want all this stuff. And, and the thing that I figured out a long time ago as a Christian is God keeps me on a need to know basis. If I don't need to know, he doesn't tell me. I just got to live by faith. Why? Because it's impossible to please God without faith. And, and I just have to believe, I have to be able to see what is invisible, the hand of God and trust him. That's faith. Rely on him. That's faith. Obey him. That's faith. Persevere through whatever challenges I go through while I obey him. That's faith. And never quit. That's faith. That's what faith is. And, and so God, I mean, Moses just did it. He did it. It worked great. And the truth is, is that when we step out on faith and God blesses it, it should be a stone to step out to another level of faith and, and, and let God bless that. And we keep building on that. Unfortunately, we oftentimes forget. I mean, literally, we just forget. It's no longer in the forefront of our minds. We forget all the great things that happen. I've shared this before. I've seen it many times. You've been around the church. You've seen this happen where people become Christians and they're boasting in how God has worked powerfully in their life. Miracles that have happened, great changes, great things. And then, you know, five years later, 10 years later, they don't know if God exists anymore. And God, they don't feel like God loves them and they don't feel like God moves anymore. And they don't feel, you know, and they lost their faith. They forgot all the ways that God had worked in their life to get to that point. And that is very important that we never forget. You remember when they crossed the river Jordan and Moses told them to put up, or it was Joshua, I think, to put up 13, to put up stones of remembrance, 12 stones of remembrance. So they would remember all the things that God had done for them, the great miracles. You remember when God tells Moses to, um, to, or tells the people of, of, of Israel, the Hebrews, that they are to not only uh, remember the things he did for them, but they're to teach their children too, so that it not get lost. Somebody once said that we are one generation away from forgetting Jesus. One generation away. All it takes is for this generation not to teach their children and the next generation will not know God and not know Jesus. We have to make sure that we're reminding people so, so that we never forget. So remembering is really key to faith. And by in verse 29, by faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. OK, he goes back to to remember when they were leaving and God pulled a miracle, a great miracle. You know, was it the Reed Sea, the Red Sea? I don't know. And it doesn't really matter. What matters is that God pulled a great miracle for them. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. You know what? I love this because it, it's, it's really an outrageous plan. I mean, 
I'm, I, I would almost call it stupid, except because God said, I'm not going to call it stupid. But I do think that God had them do something ridiculous just to show them it's not them. It's not the plan. It's the God behind it all. That's who gave them victory. They didn't have catapults. They didn't have siege ramps. They didn't have all that stuff. We've all seen the movies, Lord of the Rings. They built those huge catapults that were launching, you know, stones in. They built the, the siege ramps that they could literally just jump onto the walls. And we've seen movies that that, uh, that stuff really happened. And the Romans did that. I mean, even Masada, when the, when the Jews were all hiding on the top of a, of a mesa that there was no way to get to them. The Romans built a siege ramp out of earth that took, I forget how long, but it was a long time, like a year to build. And, and that just went straight up to the top out of land. And I mean, outrageous things that were done. They didn't have any of that. They didn't have any of those weapons. And yet they marched around the city, yelled, and the walls fall down. You know, I mean, come on. What is the lesson there? It's not the man. It's not the plan. It's God. It's God. That's where your faith needs to be. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. This is outrageous faith. Rahab is not a Jew. She's not seen all the miracles. She's heard about them and put her faith in God because of them. She recognized that you're, nobody's going to stop your God. Your God is on a roll here. He is, he's wiping everything out. He's doing everything. I'm trusting him. Our gods, they haven't done a thing. You know, we, we sacrifice, we visit, we do all this stuff. Nothing's happened, but your God has made incredible things happen. And that's not her people, but she recognized the hand of God, though she was not a Jew, though she had nobody telling her these things but she recognized the power of God. And so she sided with them, even against her own people. And she becomes a great hero, such a hero that she's even put in Jesus. She's, well, she's highlighted in Jesus' lineage. Well, what do you mean she's highlighted? Well, normally women weren't counted in a lineage. It was all the men, but she's in there. Why? Because she's awesome and an example of great faith. 32, and what more shall I say? I didn't have time to tell about Gideon you know, who took on the armies with just a few handful of men, you know, the original 300 um, who took on all the soldiers, uh, just incredible, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. I mean, just every single one of them is an incredible story of faith. Every single one of them, we, we highlight them all in our, in our book, um, Gideon defeated the Midianites. Remember, they were thick as locusts and Gideon was, was scared. And God had just told him, go in the strength you have, right? Because again, it's not the man, it's not the plan, it's the God. And Barak and Deborah defeated uh, Sisera and the Canaanites and against all odds and the charioteers, right? Uh, Samson single-handedly <clears throat> destroyed the temple of Dagon, you know, and, and Jephthah defeated the Ammonites and you know, I mean, David conquered the kingdoms and Samuel ministered justice and Daniel shut the mouths of lions and, and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego quenched the flames. And I mean, it just goes on and on, right? And this is what he's doing. He says, who through faith conquered kingdoms and ministered justice, gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned into strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead. Remember the widow with, with Elisha and, and raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better <clears throat> resurrection. And I think he's dipping into the stories of the Maccabees, which we don't typically know a lot about, but someday if you get a chance, read the book of Maccabees. You could probably find it online or, or, or buy the book at Barnes and Noble or, or on Amazon, but incredible stories of faith. You know, um, Eliezer, the priest who they tried to make him, uh, uh, eat pork and defile himself. And he refused to do it. And they literally, they put him on racks. They tore his limbs. They disconnected all his limbs. They, they, they beat him with hooks. They, they gutted him. They, they carved him up and he still refused 
or the seven sons in the book of Maccabees that, that in front of their mother, each one was tortured to death and they ripped apart their limbs and scourged them and, and gutted them and, and they all refused to, to give up their faith, refused to turn on God. And there's many more stories and it's just, and, and, and the Jews were all aware of these stories. They knew all these stories, even the Maccabees, they knew all these stories. And he says, there were others who were tortured, refusing to be released. Some faced jeers and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. Uh, uh, Zacharias was stoned. They were sawed in two. Isaiah was sawed in two, according to oral history. They were killed by the sword. They were, they went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. I mean, the promise of God, the Messiah, the the eternal rest, the new covenant of relationship, of love and and and. And, and bonding and, and being saved of all sin. None of them saw any of that. What we do every Sunday, we take communion, remember that Jesus died on the cross for us and, and shed his blood so that all our sins could be, they all dreamed that was the hope, that was the vision that they would be forgiven, that they would have all these things. They didn't. They died without ever seeing Jesus. They never knew Jesus. And he says, since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. So God counted them as righteous through their faith. They were saved by faith and then later ushered in with us to be saved by the blood of Jesus. And and with us, you know, I mean, wow, oh, what incredible stories. And and it's important to know these stories. I, I was just... Uh, Talking about turmoil, I think, I think I'd love to do a series of just the people in this chapter, although it'd have to be a really long series because there's so many great stories here and there's so many great events here. But this is, this is it right here. This is the heart of it. Be faithful to God, no matter what you're going through, no matter what hardship you're in, no matter whether your needs are being met or they're not being met whether you have everything you wish you had or you don't, whether things are happening that are making it hard on you or not, whether, whether you know, whatever situation you're in, first of all, stay close to God. Put your hope in him. Grab a hold of his promises and don't back off. Keep asking him. Jesus said, ask and you will receive. You remember the, 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 the widow, the persistent widow, and the story was of faith, of the faith of this woman who just wouldn't stop going to the judge and was given justice, which is what she wanted. Justice, a huge cry out in today's world because it needs to happen. We need to be the people crying out for justice every day. We need to be the people who are taking it to God, keeping our faith in God, doing all that we can do and all that we should do, but at the end of the day, trusting in God. And not giving up, not getting angry, not getting discouraged, not quitting, not walking away, but standing firm in the Lord. That's the message of Hebrews chapter 11. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the Lord. We trust in the Lord. They'll be brought to their knees and fall, but we will rise up and stand firm. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. I hope this has been educational and inspiring for you. If you'd like to know more, please join us by going to study.laicc.net and we'll be happy to contact you and help you in any way we can.